Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Jennifer Ablon, Editor-in-Chief of Pensions and Investments. Joining me is our Enterprise Editor, Aaron Arvidlin, and I'm also waiting for Anthony DeRosa, our new Digital Content Director. And here with us today is Mohammed El Arian, who truly needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it any anyway. He's the president of Queens College, Cambridge, chief economic advisor at Allianz, and chair of Gramercy Fund Management. If you folks aren't aware, he's also a diehard Mets and Jets fan. Thank you so much for being here, Mohammed. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Let me run down a couple of things Fed Chair Powell said at the press conference. He said, we are talking about a couple more rate increases. We're going to be cautious about declaring victory and sending signals that we think the game is won. And he also said certainty is just not appropriate here. But the markets apparently are embracing this part from Powell. So Powell said we are in the early stages of disinflation. And he said disinflation over a dozen times at the press conference yesterday. Um, Powell also said recent loosening financial conditions are not problematic. So does it appear to you that the Fed will be successful in engineering a successful soft landing for the economy? And that's a great question. And people are really struggling with this question. Um, let's start with yesterday. There were two distinct messages. If you listened to the, to the start of the press conference, and if you read the statement, you came up with a different point of view than if you listened to the rest of the press conference. That's why the market action was pretty muted when the announcement came out, because it was a fully expected 25 basis points hike. Um, there was and some you, were looking, you were looking for 50, right, Mom? I mean, no, you, know, I, I, you I were was, looking for 25, but you wanted them to do 50. I wanted them to do 50 and, and, and then declare that's it. Um, because I don't want them tightening if the economy weakens. But the key issue is that the market, when it read the announcement, was, was slightly disappointed that there was an S in further increases. Um, but it was pretty muted. And it was muted when he read out his statement. It then took off during his press conference. And we've seen, we've seen this sort of um, behavior before where, where the off-the-cuff remarks are the market-moving one. So this morning, people are trying to figure out whether, A, he is more dovish than the committee and can pull the committee that way. That's what, how the market is reacting. B, maybe he has some other indicators, especially that puzzling comments about financial conditions that he's looking at that the rest of the world doesn't see. Or maybe, um, to use the BlackRock terms, um, there was a disconnect between Powell and himself. That's, that's from BlackRock. So th there are different interpretations. Can he soft land the economy? Well, the data is certainly helping. Um, the last set of data to the fourth quarter and then most of the data we got for January tilts the balance a little bit closer to soft landing than hard landing. But there's still quite a bit to go on this one. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about financial the financial conditions remarks. Um, Powell told reporters that financial conditions had tightened significant, significantly over the past year, um, and some investors and traders had expected more concern from Powell, um, given past griping that easing conditions undercut the Fed's inflation fighting efforts. Um, what is what is he referring to? It's a head scratcher. <laughs> um, people can't figure out what he was referring to um, because he said two things. He said exactly what you said, which have tightened significantly. And he also said they're not that different from the December FOMC. However, whether you look at the Bloomberg index of financial condition or the Goldman index of financial conditions, and those are the two that are most widely monitored, they both indicate that financial conditions today are as loose as they were before the Fed started hiking. And moreover, they show that they have loosened significantly since the December FOMC meeting. So people are trying to figure out one interpretation is that just like he has moved 
to a very narrow concept of inflation. Remember, he said, I'm looking at core services, excluding housing. Right. Uh, he may have he may have. And I don't know. We don't know because the numbers are inconsistent with what he said. We may he may have some other indicator. What indicator could that be? I mean, we're all looking at the same thing. He, he may have, and I'm not saying he does, but if you wanted to get a, a, an indicator of financial conditions that has tightened, you would, you would narrow it down incredibly like to the Fed funds rate and just look at the Fed funds rate mm-hmm. and, th- and that has gone up. Um, most people don't do that because they understand that the transmission of monetary policy to the economy goes through many financial conditions, the ability of, 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 of companies to borrow, right? Um, that's a financial condition. Um, but I don't know. It's a puzzle, and people are still trying to work it out today. So, um, I, you know, I want to bring up China. Um, is China going to be an issue? I keep hearing this. So China's reopening, could that be a game changer for the inflation picture later this year? So the the answer is um, some people feel that way. I'm not there yet. So step back. There are three views of inflation for the rest of the year. There is the disinflation. We're going to get inflation is going to keep on coming down all the way down and we'll get very close to 2% at some stage. And if you extrapolate the last few months, okay, then you're there because goods disinflation has been very strong. That's view number one. We have no inflation issue. View number two, where I am, is that inflation will prove sticky when we get to about 4%. Because two things are going to happen. By the middle of this year and the third quarter, the goods disinflation is going to stop. There's a limit to how low some prices can fall. And services are going to prove to be sticky. So we'll get stuck at about 4%, and then there's going to be some really interesting choices for the Fed. Then there's a third view. It was expressed most recently um, in Davos, and there was the head of the Norwegian Sovereign Fund, who believes that inflation will start going back up in the second half of this year because of China, because China will push up significantly goods inflation at a time when service inflation isn't down, isn't isn't coming down, and then you get the U. Um, in inflation. I'm not there. I want to stress, I am not there. But that's where the China effect be- can complicate the inflation picture. So I'm going to uh, invite Erin Arvidlin to ask her questions at the moment. Erin? Uh, yeah, Mohammed, thank you for being here. Um, here's a here's a simpleton question. Are we in a recession? And if, if we are, uh, why are we in a recession? Um, Thanks, Aaron. Actually, it's not a simple question. I do not believe we're in a recession, nor do I believe a recession is 100% probability, as as Bloomberg Economics has predicted. Um, Why are we not in a recession? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, the labor market. We have an incredibly strong labor market. Yesterday, we had the JOLTS numbers, which is the amount of job openings. They went up. They went up to 11 million, and they now outnumber the unemployed by a factor of 1.9. So there is one person unemployed for every 1.9 job open. So the labor and the unemployment rate is, is near record lows. So it's very difficult to say there's a recession going on from the labor market. From the goods market, while the forward indicators are worrisome, the forward indicators are worrisome, the current indicators are so strong. And we saw that again today with the numbers that came out. So, Aaron, um, in terms of of your your question, we are not in a recession. There's a possibility of a recession, but it's not nowhere near the 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 hundred percent or you know the eighty or ninety percent that some people claim it is. In my view, okay. And um, my second question is: uh, as our audience is pension funds and other institutions, should they be increasing their fixed income exposure like for instance looking at the two years you know they're earning over four percent um and if they if they are um what 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 parts of the market are you interested in 
So this question a month ago and two months ago was a, a no-brainer, literally a no-brainer. Um, fixed income was incredibly attractive. It was attractive on a standalone basis. It was attractive historically. And on a risk-adjusted basis, it was attractive relative to equities. Um, the problem that investors have today is that we've had a massive rally in the first month and two days in fixed income. I mean, massive, absolutely massive. Um, the 10-year is down 50 plus basis points. Um, there's been quite a bit of rally in credit spreads. Um, so the value is still there, but it's not as compelling as it was a, a month and two months ago when it was really compelling. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's dilemma facing investors. Do do they come in now? And they should if they believe that a soft landing is possible and the Fed is basically done. Or should they wait um, if they believe that we may get less of a soft landing and the Fed is not done? That's the judgment that they have to make. And it's a judgment that's being forced on them by the incredible rally that we've had in fixed income prices and markets more generally in the last five weeks. And what about gold and, dare I say, crypto? I know that the last time we spoke on Twitter spaces, um, I think you were um, scaling back on your Bitcoin exposure. Is that right? So I sold my Bitcoin exposure a long time ago. <laughs> um, and, you know, I... I bought it at 4,000, sold it at 19,000. And if you think that sounds good, I saw it then go up all the way up to 68,000. Today, it's around 23,000, okay? So even, you know, given what has been happening, um, I, I sold way, way, way too early, but that's years ago. Um, and I haven't gone back in since. Um, look, Bitcoin, despite the big cloud hanging over crypto, um, is the best performer so far this year up by 40%. Um, and what that reflects is it's the high beta um, asset when risk appetite come back in force. And that's what we've seen um, this year. Um, you know, I, I'm not investing in Bitcoin, I, I, so I'm not the right person to ask. But again, you've had a 40% increase and it has happened really quickly, which is the exactly same di investment dilemma as you've had elsewhere. And that, that is the big dilemma right now. And it really forces you to take a view on the economics, soft landing or less of a soft landing on, and on the policy. And what about gold? Again, it's, it, it, they all come down to the same thing. And, and this is where the market right now is, is gonna have to make some difficult decisions because the next, the next stage of the rally it is not as obvious as the first stage. And, and as I said, the first stage happened really quickly. So investors as a whole are sort of being forced into this, these corner solutions, um, whereas really beforehand, they could be somewhere more in the middle with optionality. Now, increasingly, they're being forced into, into those corner solutions on economics and policy issues. So, so Mohammed, what are you personally invested in? You know, I don't like answering that question. <laughs> That's why I asked. No, I, I don't like answering that question because it gets completely misinterpreted. Just like I don't like answering the question, what do you propose I do, you do, because I don't know what your, initial, your, your conditions are. I don't know, you know what your risk reference is. Um, so these has, they have to be very individualized answers. Um, and they're not suitable for, for a forum like this, where we have lots, lots of friends and acquaintances and co colleagues on. Okay, so, so let's, 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 let's pivot to, to equities. Um, we have seen a very strong start to the year for, for stocks. Um, and there, you know, there are a lot of traders on here. What is your overall view on the stock market? I mean, it, it's been an amazing start, right? And if you've been in the NASDAQ, you've significantly outperformed the Dow and the S&P. Um, if you've been abroad, 
is, you know, including in Europe, you significantly outperformed the U.S. And if you've been in, in last year's losers, you've significantly outperformed last year's outperformers. So it, it, it's not just that we've had this, this lovely rally in stocks, is that we've had quite a bit of differentiation um, that goes counter to not just last year, but in the case of Europe versus the U.S., many years. So um, that's the situation we're in. Um, it is the soft landing trade that benefits the world as a whole. Um, so this is where we are. Going forward, I think it's really important um, to be a stock picker and not an index picker. I think this is a world in which um, generalized investments, which was really the theme of the last few weeks, is going to give way to even more differentiation. And if you look at what happened to Meta today, that's a perfect example okay, of, of what I'm talking about. So it really is a stock picking environment. Um, and one needs to look beyond the U.S., Mohammed, in, I had the a U question. in the U.S. and beyond the U.S., okay? Not just in the U.S. is what I meant to say. Uh, Mohammed, Aaron here again. Um, I wanted to ask you what areas of the economy, if we're not in a recession, um, if, we, if, if we are going to have another uh, rate increase, what areas of the economy do you see being squeezed the most and, and which might benefit? Okay, so, so let me take a little bit, take you to my baseline, because you know, it does really matter what view of the world you have. Um, so I think that growth will be anemic, but not, not in a recession. And I think that by the mid middle of, of the year, we're going to see inflation stuck at about 4%. And the reason why this will happen is because inflation has migrated. And that's the cost of the Federal Reserve being late. That's the cost of the Federal Reserve having mischaracterized inflation as transitory till the very end of November of 2021. And then when they started hiking rates in March of 2022, they started very slow. And then they were forced into the 475 basis point hikes. So inflation dynamics have changed. It started out being two products, food and energy. It then migrated to the goods sector as companies felt they had pricing power and they passed on the higher cost. Now it's in the service sector. Uh, the goods sector is disinflating. It is mm -hmm. in the service sector. That is a very important change because services are less sensitive to monetary policy and you bring in wages. And that becomes an important input into inflation. So because when, when I analyze what I think will be going on, and I want to judge, this is just my analysis, it can easily be wrong, I suspect we get stuck at around 4%. And that happens in the summer, the third quarter of the year, basically. And at that point, the Fed will have three choices. Choice number one is you crush the economy to get service inflation down. And th that is the view of people who, who, are, who are telling us that the unemployment rate will go up to 5%. That basically the Fed is going to crush the economy to get to 2%. That's option A, Op which I think is, is not a good option, but that's option mm -hmm. A. Option B, you recognize that the 2% target was arbitrary to begin with. It is not the target that you would choose today because there's so much going on on the supply side. You opt for a target of 3 to 4%, which would be more appropriate. The problem with that is that no central bank likes doing this when it has missed the inflation target for so long. The ones that have done so in the past in developing countries have completely de-anchored inflation expectation. So they won't even talk about this publicly until um, they are in a stable inflation framework, mm -hmm. which leaves you with the third choice. You continue to promise 2% inflation in the future. You see whether society lives with a stable, stable 3 to 4%. And then down the road, you'd transition to that as an official target. That is the choice the Fed is going to have to make um, 
in my opinion, in the third quarter. And it is not an easy choice. And where, where, which, uh, where do you stand on those three choices? So I wouldn't crush the economy just to get to an arbitrary target of 2%. <laughs> right. I wouldn't increase the target when I'm way above it. So I would do number three. Look, there is no first best, right? We, we gave up on the first best when we mischaracterized inflation for so long and when we started um, in such a such muted fashion. So when you're no longer in a world of first best, inevitably, whatever you do, second best, third best, inevitably, whatever you do is not just not perfect, but it also has unintended consequences. So yes, um, you know, is, is it great to do it that way? No, but it, so, it sure beats the other alternatives. I'm going to bring in Anthony DeRosa here. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Jen. Uh, hi, Mohammed. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm with uh, Pensions and Investments. Uh, my question is regarding employment uh, and the fact that uh, the job market has been so resilient in the face of the Fed up until this point. At what point do you see the, the job market starting to show some cracks? It, it already seems like it, it's beginning uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks. It, is that a big concern for you? And my second part of my question is, uh, how if, if we are going to be entering recession, if we're not already, do you think it'll be a shallow recession or it's going to be more of an extended one? Thank you, Anthony, very much. Um, on the first one, um, let me start first with what can go really well for the labor market, because we must not forget about that. And that is higher labor force participation. If we could get back near the peaks of labor force participation that we've had, we, we could have a soft landing. We could have all sorts of good things happening. Um, that requires policies. And I must stress, there's another country where I'm speaking to you right now, the UK, where there's the same issue, labor force participation. People haven't re-entered the labor market. So they're trying an experiment, which is a really interesting one, that at doctor offices, they're going to have people who are going to ask you, are you in the workforce or not? And if your answer is not, they're going to encourage you to join back, the over 50s, as they call them. And they, they piloted that, by the way in a very limited fashion, and I got 50% hit rate. So that there's some excitement about that. But the key issue is to increase labor force participation. For us, it's about skills. It's about childcare. It's about all the issues that keep people out of the labor force. If we can do that, Anthony, then we, we don't need to go through something very painful. I just want to put that because we don't talk about that enough. Um, we don't talk enough about what we can do to the supply side to make um, not only the soft landing more probable, but to make our growth potential go up. As to what can go wrong, well, we're starting to hear it, as you said, a whole host of layoffs. And what we're starting to see is that companies feel they have air cover. The more layoffs that are announced, the more likely you are to announce layoffs. And that is because every once in a while, companies go through um, labor force reallocations within them. Certain skills are no longer needed and new skills are needed. And if you can have the air cover of layoff announcements coming left, right and center, which they're starting to, then that encourages you to go forward. So, so that is the risk to the labor market right now is that we see not only layoffs in terms of just um, the immediate business need, but also as companies reorganize their resources for a different world. And it is a different world. Mohammed, what worries you the most about um, what's happening in the global economy? I think um, a couple of things. And I just realized I didn't answer Anthony's question about if we get a recession um, will it be short and shallow? Okay. Um, I apologize, Anthony, and I'll cover it here. Um, first is the growth dynamics. We really have a problem generating economic growth that is high, inclusive, and sustainable. We simply don't have potent growth models in most of the major countries. And that, that really worries me. Um, 
and we need we need to find a solution to that and it's not easy it's politically not easy um from an analytical point of view it it's not that hard but politically it's not easy so number one is growth and you need only look at the imf uh, projections for quote subpar growth yes they were less gloomy but but go beyond 2023 and you don't get much growth in this global economy and we do need growth um, that is high inclusive and sustainable so issue number one is the growth issue um, issue number two is what i call little fires everywhere borrowing the term from somewhere else and that's what's happening in the developing world. We're not paying much attention to it because they're little fires. We tend to pay attention to the big fires. But if you look at Ghana, if you look at Pakistan, if you look at Zambia, if you look at Ecuador, if you look at Egypt, if you look at Turkey, um, and I've, I've missed a few because I don't have the list in front of me, you know, there are things going on there that you need to pay close attention to. Now, little fires are fine as long as they remain little fires. What you don't want is the little fires to start joining up um, contagion. That's why India today is something you've got to keep an eye on because um, there is a corporate, as we know, there's a corporate um, drama going on right, there, right now. And it is really important that that remains just a isolated focus case because you don't want India, um, you don't want questions to, 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 to start happening about India. You know, you saw what happened in China when one of the most unexpected questions I had to answer over and over again in 2021 was, is China investable? You certainly don't want to go there with other countries. And you're talking about Adani. I am. Okay. Um, I had a question for you, Mohammed. Aaron here again. Um, how, how worried are you about this, um, the debt ceiling fight over spending cuts? Um, is it just, sort of the same old, same old, or political posturing, or is there any real risk that you can see? So, Aaron, I am in the market consensus. Um, I don't think it will have last, lasting effects. I think it's more a political drama than it will be an economic or a financial drama. Um, I think, I hope it will be resolved. And if it's not resolved, it will be a repeat of what, what we saw just over 10 years ago. 12 years ago, um, that it then gets resolved pretty quickly um, because people start realizing that it is a very unpopular thing for for the American public, okay? Um, so it's very, very politically unpopular to, t to tip the U.S. into a technical default when it's completely unnecessary. So I am with the consensus, and I hope, that we are all correct, <laughs> but that's where I am, Aaron. Thank you. Anthony. Um, Mohammed, following up on the question I had about um, whether it's going to be a shallow or a, a long recession, uh, do, what, do you think if the Fed stays hawkish and they continue these hikes longer than you would like. I know you thought that they should have went higher this one and then stopped and paused here. What, what do you think that can impact whether we have a longer recession or not? Yes, absolutely. So, so the nightmare solution, the nightmare outcome is the following, is that um, inflation starts going up at the end of the year. And I told you that there are certain people who, who, who believe that's going to happen. And the Fed is then forced to hike into a weaker economy. That's, that's why, you know, I was among those. Just get them done while the economy is strong, while the markets are buoyant. Just get them out of the way and then let the lagged effects come in. Um, so the risk is, Anthony, and I'm not, I'm, this is, I want to stress, this is a risk scenario. This is not my baseline. This is a risk scenario. But it's in response to a question, is that they are forced back into hiking when the economy has weakened significantly because inflation is heading back up. That's the risk scenario. And then you're not talking about a short and shallow recession. And the way that the markets are reacting in a positive way, do you think that is 
giving the Fed some pause? And is is that impact? Does the Fed look at the market reaction at all? Does that does that have any effect in how they respond in terms of what they're going to do next? So I tweeted out today, earlier today, if there's one thing I would love to know, which is elusive, is whether how the Fed feels about what has happened. How does the Fed feel that the two-year yield has plummeted 15 basis points? How does it feel about that? Okay, And that, that again, was all the result of the press conference. How, how does it feel about that? Um, we, we will never know for sure but the one thing to, to look for is whether you get what you've gotten in the past with this Fed, which is after a few days, other Fed officials start correcting our understanding of what we heard. Right? But the key question, Anthony, is you know, how do I feel about the market reaction? I don't think they anticipated it, to tell you the truth. I just don't know about how they feel about it. So, um, Mohammed, just to re- reiterate, um, you would have preferred a 50 bo- basis point hike. That didn't happen. Now, what would you like to see happen? Um, you know, whenever things you want don't happen and then you ask what do you want to see happen, you, you're far away from, from what you think is good <laughs> outcomes. OK, I suspect right. I suspect they'll hike one to two more times. Um well, the markets feel that way, Mohammed, right? No, no, the market, the market, the market I mean, is much, much more dovish than that. Well, they're looking the, for. Do you think the market? Well, it looks like the markets are looking for cuts, also. Yeah, the markets are looking for at most one more hike, right? And if if this continues pretty soon, they won't even look for that anymore, and then they're expecting cuts um, le- le- from the from from the middle of the year, whereas the Fed has told us over and over again. They don't intend to cut. You know, it, it is interesting that we don't fear the Fed. Um, they've been giving us very clear signals, and the market simply has said, you're wrong. You're going to be forced to what we expect, Federal Reserve. So so this is interesting. I don't remember such a, such a, a long-duration disagreement where, where the market simply don't listen to what has been very clear and consistent Fed guidance. So I know you have to go, but I did add Bobby as a speaker. Bobby, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, Thank you. Uh, Mohammed. um, just a quick autopsy on the bear market and bonds. One of the things that is troubling is that if you look at total global debt and you look at the FTSE uh, government bond index, the modified duration of that index has been rising steadily since 1990, going from about four and a half, I think at the peak, it was an 8.8 duration. So what we've seen here is that uh, price sensitivity to yield changes is greater than ever. Can we continue on that trend? And uh, should central banks and other institutions be doing some sensitivity analysis and, you know, kind of if we do a shock uh, to um, a stress test with, let's say, a 10-year at 7% uh, or a curve that stretches from 5% to 7%, you know, what would it look like? Do you have any thoughts on rising duration? Bobby, that's a great question. And, And you're getting both rising duration and a rising stock, right? So, so that, that makes it more, more interesting. And that's before you factor in QT. Um, the Fed has so far contracting its balance sheet in a very orderly fashion by half a trillion. They wanted to make it seem like it's watching paint dry and they've been successful so far on this. Um, yes, yes. The answer is yes. Policymakers should look at that. It's also the debt issuance department should be looking at that as well, because that has a debt issuance issue. Um, the other thing you're doing, Bobby, and thank you for that. When we go beyond this year, what's inflation going to look like? What's what's growth going to look like? Um, at some point, we've got to deal with the following things: the level of debt, the rewiring of supply chains, 
the persistent geopolitical tensions, the energy transition and demographics. These are issues that we keep keep on pushing back. Um, but if you are a long-term investor and if you are putting your money away and, and I'm going to force you into a certain scenario and you can't touch it for five to 10 years, you're taking a view on these things. Um, if you're going to, into private equity, you're taking a view on these things. So um, thank you, Bobby, for also pointing out not just the day one issues, but the issues beyond day one. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a paper on the, uh, the building duration risk uh, as a threat to safe assets. And maybe I'll send you a copy. Um, I'd love to see it. I'd yeah, love we, to see it. We were, we were big uh, uh, partners with PIMCO when I was working for Seth at uh, Merrill. So I would love your um, input on this. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thank, Thank you, right. Bobby. Mohammed, I know you have to go. Any lasting thoughts for us? No, I just thank you very much for organizing this. And I really appreciate the interaction and everybody that, that called in. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you next week.